So we're at the point of, of, our, of our series here where we do get to talk about applications of what you can do with this. Today we're going to discuss how you find the volume of certain figures and how you do it with disks and washers. Now I, I know you're probably thinking, disks and washers, what in the world does that mean? What do those little washer donut looking things and disks have to do with finding volume or even integrals? But I'm going to show you that it does, it actually does. So. Here's the idea. I'm, I'm going to try to build this up for you so you kind of understand where this stuff's coming from instead of just give you the formula, just like I did for derivatives, just like I did for integrals. I'm going to do the same thing for volume. You follow me? Now, do you remember the Riemann sums where we took a whole bunch of rectangles and found arbitrary points and then added their areas together? Okay, we are going to do the same thing with the volumes. You ready for it? So I'll try to break it down. Again, it's not going to be too, too bad, but we're going to talk about first the, the volumes by slicing. And what that means is, what if we did the same thing we did for areas? Areas, we, we had this figure, the one I draw all the time, and we sliced it up, right? And we made lots of little rectangles. We made lots of rectangles, we added up the widths times the heights of all those rectangles, thereby getting the areas of all the rectangles. That's basically the idea that we're going to use only on a volume type application. So let's talk about that. So right now we'll discuss the volume by slicing. Solids as, as a solid figure. Okay. Solid figure. Uh, yeah, we don't mean <laughs> we don't mean a piece of cake is different than jello. Okay. <laughs> no, that's what I was thinking of. Oh, that's not what I mean. Uh, jello goes like this. Pudding like this. Cake sticks together. No, not that kind of solid. I mean, like you have this this three dimensional shape that doesn't have any holes through the middle of it. Okay, that's a solid. So it could be liquid. It doesn't matter what it is. It's contained, and it does. It's not changing shape. You understand? Mm -hmm. That's all. No holes in the middle of it either. So here's the deal. Let's take some random figure that I'm going to create right now. That. So that, that's maybe the side view of this figure. And let's make it three-dimensional. Is that three-dimensional enough for you? Can you see it okay? Okay, so that's my, my figure. Here's the idea. What if we could take and make slices of this, this thing? If we can find the volume of a slice, then we should be able to add all the slices together and find the volume of the whole figure. Do you see how this kind of parallels the area under a curve idea? So we're going to try to find, let's, let's make a slice. So some random slice of this thing. I'll take it here. You guys having a hard time doing the whole three-dimensional thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it's kind of difficult. You get used to it after a while. Do you see the, the slice I'm trying to portray right there? Mm -hmm. So basically, this is a weird shaped cake. You did a bad job on your cake. <laughs> but let's we'll take two planes, right? Two pieces of paper or laser beams or something. So we have this nice slice of this, this cake and you're going to serve someone your crappy made cake. You got it? No icing even. Kind of a host are you. 
Uh, but anyhow, that's, that's what we're going to do. So our idea is, let's cut this into thin slabs, we'll call it, a slicing or a slab. And we're going to try to use a Ramon sum, use our sums that we used before, to set up some sort of integral. So this is our idea. I'm going to write it out. I'm going to try to walk you through this so you understand where it's coming from. So idea. Cut into thin slabs. Then we'll use a Riemann sum or, or summations. So we'll use our summations to set up an integral. You make a little a side note here, this is much, much like the area problem. Very much, only it's in three dimensions. So in order to do this though, well, how do we find, I'll, I'll kind of break this down so you understand it. Do you, let me start over then. Do you understand what's going to happen with this slab? What's going to happen with that slab? If it's much like the area problem, what's going to happen to that slab? It's going to get very, very thin. Very, very thin. Very thin. Now think of a volume. A volume area for you guys typically is base times width times height, right? But that's only of a, of a rectangle. It's only of a rectangle. And things don't have to be rectangular. So I'll say it this way. Volume is typically the surface area times its length. Does that make sense? So whatever the surface area is, or the in our case, the cross-sectional area times its width. So if I found the cross-sectional area, so I cut it this, like, I cut it this way. I take my slab out. I turn it towards you. That's the cross section. Can you picture that three-dimensionally? You cut it like here. I'm cutting it. I pick it off. I turn it this way. What you're looking at right now is the cross section. If I take the cross-sectional surface area times its width, that's going to give me a very good approximation of its volume, right? If the width of that slab goes like this, that gives me an exact interpretation of that volume because it has very little width. Does that make sense to you? Very much like finding the area of those rectangles and say, hey, I can find the area, now take it to zero. That's now an exact area if I add them all together. And that's what we're doing here, except in terms <coughs> of volume. So in order to do this, we need to find the area of the cross section. To do this, I mean that, we got to find the area of cross section. Well, in general, we would do this. I'll try to break down so you see where all this stuff's coming from. If we had just a, a basic, like, rectangular prism, if we had just a basic, do you see the rectangular prism? If we had just a basic rectangular prism, and it was, I don't know, going through, through some axis. Like that. Like maybe the x-axis. If we wanted to find the cross section, well, what we would have to do is take a slab, or take a slice to find the area, and we'd slice it like this. Oops, that's way off. There we go. We do some sort of a slice. Now tell me something. If this distance is x, it's on the x-axis, and this distance is, let's say, oh, what did I call it? I think I called it y for that. And this distance is y, and this is z. Could you find the surface area of the cross section? Would it have anything to do with x? 
what would it have to do with? Just y and z for the cross section. So, so check this out. If I asked you to find the volume of this whole thing, here's how you'd do it. You'd probably say, oh, well, I know the volume of a rectangular prism. The volume of a rectangular prism is just the base times the height times the width. So, so basically, it's the y times the z times the x. Do you follow me on that? Now, I'm going to kind of prove to you that this is the cross-sectional area times the length. You, do you agree that this is the volume of this figure, no matter what? What's y times z? y times z is the surface area of the cross section. That's, that's what that is. So basically this says, oh, that's the surface area of the cross section times x, the length. So this is surface area of cross section. And that's the length. Well, now, now here's the idea. If that's the case, then what we're basically doing here is making a whole bunch of these things. Do you see it? Making a whole bunch of those things and then adding up all the volumes. Very similar to making rectangles for areas. We're making rectangular <coughs> prisms for volumes. And we're going to add them all up. So what the idea I needed to get across to you was that a volume is basically a surface area times the length. How many people feel okay with that? Surface area times the length gives you the volume. Good deal. Now we can solve any volume where the solid is bound by planes that are perpendicular to the x-axis. Here, here let, me, let me explain it to you. If this was like this, and it was not straight up and down, could you cut it into slabs? It wouldn't look right. It wouldn't be a slab to start with. That would be a problem here. Slabs, yes, slabs that are perpendicular. That's very nice and easy. We can do that. So now we, we, we've got it down to if our sides are perpendicular to the x-axis, we can start cutting it into slabs and approximating, approximating by rectangular prisms. Do you see that, the point? If they're not perpendicular to the x-axis, then this method's not going to work for us. We have to do something else. But if the sides are perpendicular, we're good to go. Now we can find the volume of any solid that's bound by planes that are perpendicular to the x-axis. You know, I probably should say at points A and B. So at, at where we're starting and where we're stopping. So if we only wanted to find the volume between here and here, it would just have to be perpendicular at those points. The, the rest of it really wouldn't matter. Just like the area under a curve doesn't matter if it's undefined. It's just between the two intervals that, that we talked between the interval that we talked about. Are you, are you following me on that one? So at points, at points A and B. 